I mentioned last time, but just to be a little more clear, um, I do have the uh, recordings of the lectures. Um, they're on YouTube, and there's a link to them from the course webpage. So if you want to go back and study, uh, you, can, you already have all the notes. You already knew you could download those as PDFs, but you can actually you know, watch the lecture with uh, audio. Um, also, uh, as far as the uh, midterm goes, let me just say a few things. Um, the midterm is about, um, it's not going to be focused on proving properties that we learn in this class. It's going to be more focused on understanding them and using them. So even though in the problem set and also the practice problem set, which is online now, which will not be graded, but it's just there for your, for your practice, there are problems about proving these properties. And that's so that you understand the properties well. But don't expect that the, that the exam is going to be all about proving the intricacies of what we learned. It's more going to be about have you, you know, internalized them and are you able to use them. Um, OK. So um, good. Let's, uh, yes? No sample midterm. Yeah. So just, to, I mean, expect it to be, you know, things that we've covered in problem sets, those types of things you should, you should know well. Those are the types of things that will be ex on the exam. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's why I mentioned that, that part of it, because there were proofs on the problem sets, and that's not going to be a focus on the exam. Yeah. yeah. So, OK. Um, all right. So if you recall, last time we had an example. We started with an example of an image that was smoothed by doing a local averaging. All right, it was noisy. We added noise, and then we smoothed it to kind of make the, mitigate the noise a little bit. And let's just, in, in one dimension, like we're usually dealing with in this class, you could imagine a discrete time signal that maybe uh, looks like something like this. And you might say, oh, that looks kind of noisy, but it looks like there's some underlying shape to it. Okay, And um, one thing you might do to process this, if you imagine that a lot of these fluctuations are noise, uh, a natural thing to do is a local averaging, just like we did in the image. So local averaging means, I'll get rid of this here, means that um, you have some averaging shape. Let's say we just do a, a normal average, meaning we'll take some window around each time point. So, so we're going to produce a new signal. We're going um, to produce the signal at a given point in time, we'll take some window around it, let's say two points in each direction. Okay, We'll take all of those samples. I'm just drawing a new axis for the output. And we'll average them. So here the average might be something like, um, you know, something like this. Okay, it's this value. So, and since I drew a new axis, I'm going to copy that down here. I would get something like, um, just repeat that number down on my new graph. Okay, so the output would be the average of the nearest five things. Um, and then to calculate the output at the next point in time, I would move my window. So I would get rid of this part. I would look at a new sample over here, and I would compute a new average. Right? I would say, OK, what's the average of these five? And maybe it's something a little higher. Um, you know, maybe it's up here, the average. So I would, my output then would be that, something there. Okay? Uh, and in the end, what I would end up with was something that looks maybe like it has a lot of the general shape, but re doesn't have some of the noise. Okay, so when I take these averages, I might get something like that. All right. Um, now, there's another way to explain what this averaging is doing. It was mentioned that this is convolution. So can somebody identify what I'm convolving? So I'm convolving my signal x here. This is xn. Let's say this is smooth using averaging.
So it, sometimes it's helpful that, to draw it overlaid on the original graph. So it would be something that roughly, you know, um, of course it's discrete time, but I'm just going to give a general shape here. After averaging, you'll get something that, you know, maybe looks smoother, but I drew it as a line, whereas, of course, we're going to get a discrete time thing. Okay, so what is this? What are we, um, what are we convolving x with to get y? So this is yn, and we're saying xn, sorry, yn equals xn convolved with something, and we can actually identify exactly what that is. What is that? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so it's like a, a weighting function. So let's say in this example, suppose I did a completely, uh, uh, the usual average where everything was weighted equal. What would, the, what would it be specifically here? That's right. So it's a rect, it's a discrete time rect. Um, uh, since we haven't defined a discrete time rect, and I don't want to be, uh, you know, we'll have to be picky about the edges and stuff. I'll just say it's, del it's, a, it's five points, right? Delta n minus 2 plus delta n minus 1 plus, and anything in discrete time can be written this way. Delta n plus delta n plus 1. Actually, I'm going to make these ones pluses. Okay. Delta n minus 1 plus delta n minus 2, which is a rect, but if we defined rect, um, depends on how we would define a rect. Okay, so in other words, it's this signal here. Here's n, and it's like this. Zero, one, two, minus 1, minus 2. So it's just flat for five samples. Okay? And if you go through and think about the, what convolution does, you'll see that convolution between an input x and this rect is exactly local averaging. All right? So this very natural thing you might do to process a, a signal is actually a convolution. It's actually a linear time invariant uh, system that you're applying. Okay. So what's fun is that means you can... Um, that means that um, you can understand what's going on uh, through the convolution property. So let's, let's um, talk about convolution and the Fourier transform. Okay, so this is the, the most important property for us of the Fourier transform. And that is that um, if you take the Fourier transform of x, let's just go back to continuous time here to keep things simple, x of t convolved with uh, y of t, then that equals the Fourier transform of x of t times the Fourier transform of y of t. Right, and we can actually verify. Did you verify this? Did Sai go through and derive it? No? Does anyone remember? Because we can do it. It'll take about two minutes. He did it in discrete time. OK, that's good enough. We'll, we'll stick with that. So yeah, and you can, if you want to do it yourself, uh, you can follow the same steps from discrete time and do it in continuous time. Okay, so this is actually very nice because we usually abbreviate this as X of uh, F, capital X of F, and this is capital Y of, of F. So you just multiply X of F and Y of F, the Fourier transforms. Very nice because convolution is, well, it's convoluted, right? It's, very, it's, it's not completely natural. You get used to it. You could look at two signals and get used to what kind of thing you expect the convolution to, to look like before calculating it, but um, it's, it's involved. However, multiplication is extremely straightforward. Okay? So, for example, what this means is if we have a system, okay, if we have some system that's LTI, 
and it's got it's a convolution with an H of T. All right. This is exactly in the time domain. We would say, okay, X of T went in, and Y of T uh, X of T convolved with Y of T came out. Okay, but in the frequency domain, we would say, well, sometimes we'll write X of F goes in. Of course, we really mean that the time signal went in, but we're just representing it in the frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, all that's happening here is you're multiplying by the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Okay, so what comes out is the same signal that went in in frequency times some shaping. And it's very easy to understand because the effect on each frequency is independent of all the rest of the signal. So an LTI system can only rescale frequencies um, and, and treats every frequency component of the input separately. All right, so what that means is if we graph, for example, I mean, just to drive this point home, in frequency, we might have something like, um, you know, x of t looks like this. Here's zero frequency. I'm, of course, it's complex, but I'm, I'm not going to give exact values here. I'm just, this is just a illustration. All right. And so this is x, x of f goes in. If you have some system, um, an LTI system, and you graph the uh, Fourier transform of the impulse response, let's say it's like this. Um, Suppose it goes like this. This is what the Fourier transform of the impulse response of the system is, H of F. We call this thing sometimes the frequency response. So it's very easy in the frequency domain to know what is going to happen to any signal, in particular this blue signal that I've drawn here. What's going to come out is the product of these. So you're going to get out a signal that, whoops, let me. You're going to get out something that looks roughly like this. I mean, you know, I don't know what the heights are that I made here, but let's see. Um, perhaps this would be more interesting if I, if I put a little squigglies on, on the input signal. So the input signal has something like that. Then what's going to come out will be something like that, right? Okay. So all we do is multiply each frequency, and, and you can think of um, this LTI system. Then is just it's amplifying or it's uh, attenuating different frequencies, but it's very consistent. Every time you put a signal through, it'll either you know amplify a particular frequency or it'll attenuate it depending on what the Fourier transform says. All right. So very simple systems like you have in your uh, radios. Uh, you have like a, a boost the base, right? Every radio has a button like this. And that's just going to be, that could be done with an LTI system because boost the base means multiply low frequencies by something greater than one. All right. And any time you have a system that's just going to multiply certain fixed frequencies by given values, that's exactly what LTI systems do. That's, that is an LTI system. All right. So we can then look at what is this averaging doing. So we said that this averaging here, convolution with this rect. Now I'm going to do this in this example in continuous time, but just think of the analogy of it. Suppose you have um, so consider an averaging system. That's like this. Um, that is um, input x of t convolved with rect, but we're going to give it an arbitrary uh, width. So rect of a width um, cap t. And when we average, of course, we also want to make it, uh, whenever you average, you, you make the weights sum to 1. Okay, so we would have a 1 over t here as well. So this convolution would be taking an average of some, over some window of your input signal of width t centered at 0. 
All right, that's what that's what this means. Okay, now in the frequency domain, let's see what that is actually doing and why we why we like the result or don't like the result. Okay, so Fourier transform of one over t. All right. This, by linearity, of course, the 1 over t just comes right out. And we have a scaling property here. So it's the Fourier transform of rect of t over cap t. And the time scaling property says that this should equal, um, we have our 1 over t, and then the result of this next part is t sinc of um, tf. All right, that's what the... We're assuming t is positive. Right, so. All right, so that's um, so. This is what the frequency response is of that sort of smoothing. All right, so all right. So let's plot this. Now, I say plot the Fourier transform. And unless I'm drawing a cartoon picture, then we would need to be plotting complex numbers in general, right? So now this turns out that this Fourier transform is real. In general, it would be complex. But what you do is to, to plot the complex numbers of a Fourier transform, you either make a three-dimensional plot, all right? Or if you're doing it by hand, you usually don't do that. You do uh, two separate plots, all right? So uh, you have a choice. You can plot the real and imaginary part separately. That's one natural choice. But that's not, that's not often the, most, uh, the, the best representation for you to take something away from the plot. Right? The reason we plot things is so you can look at it and, and learn something from it. So instead of real part and an imaginary part on a separate plot, we often do the magnitude and the phase. Those are usually more meaningful. All right? So the magnitude of this. Since it's real, the phase is, is not very interesting. But the magnitude of, let me, let me give this a name. Call this thing H. So we call this thing H of F. So the magnitude of H of F, the absolute value of sync. Okay, now this it goes like this. Whoops, it's absolute value, right? So, that's the absolute value of sync. Uh, TF. All right, and um, we would also do like a phase plot, but uh, again, I'm going to skip that here because it's not interesting. Okay, so where so where does this cross the zero? Where are these zero crossings here? So they're at multiples of uh, one over t. Yeah, so this is at one over t, two over t, and so forth. Okay, so the it's interesting that now we can interpret this averaging, which seems so natural, in the frequency domain. What we did is we took our original signal, which maybe had content all over the place. You know, maybe it was some, some important thing. Okay, and we, and then what we said was let's uh, pass it, let's let's act on it with this frequency response. So what's going to happen? Generally speaking, what does this look like? Actually, I should draw it a little bit more carefully on this side here. I should emphasize that sync. Sync, um, yeah, it decays here. My other picture didn't show it decaying very well, right? Okay. Um, so generally speaking, what are we doing to the frequencies? So, are we? Are, can you say we're keeping certain ones more than others? Oh, by the way, what's the height of this thing? The height is just one. So we're not amplifying anything. Good. We're just 
attenuating some things. And what are we attenuating? We're attenuating the high frequencies. And of course, the, the cutoff, of, it doesn't cut off sharply, but it, it falls off and doesn't let higher frequencies through as much. And we can affect how low we want to go or how high we want to go by picking T, right? If we pick 1 over T to be very large, in other words, if we take, pick T to be very small, we'll be keeping a lot of frequencies before they start getting attenuated. If we make T be very big, we, we lose a lot of frequencies. We keep only very low ones. Think of that in the time domain. What, what does that mean? Well, if we're averaging for a very long time, we're going to get rid of a lot of movements that happen quickly. That's high frequency stuff, right? So we'll lose high frequency stuff the longer we do an average. The shorter we do the average, the more, you know, the, the more we keep. But the whole point, purportedly, what we were trying to do was remove some noise. And the reason you might do such an averaging to remove noise is actually because you believe the noise has a lot of high frequency components and low frequency components. If you add random noise to something, it's going to have roughly equally high and low frequencies. Okay? Whereas the, when you looked at this data, you said, oh, I think there's some important lower frequency content. And the noise is messing everything up, so why don't I cut out the high frequency stuff? All right, and that's effectively what you did by doing the averaging. You did exactly that. You, you cut out high frequency stuff, but you did it according to this shape. Now, maybe this isn't an ideal shape. I mean, it has all these weird features to it. It's got little spots where it cuts out everything entirely. You can think about, you know, as an exercise for yourself, you can think, how does it cut out any frequencies that are exactly at these uh, nulls here are going to be completely removed? How does averaging do that? And just think about what would happen if you averaged a sinusoid of just, and you matched up the, the width of the averaging exactly with the period of the sinusoid. It goes away, right? Um, so um, now you could say, I, this is less than ideal. I would rather have something that maybe, um, you know, maybe I want it to cut off more sharply. Suppose I said, I want this frequency response. I want low pass filter. OK, now we're using words that we'll explore a little more after, the, uh, after spring break, filtering. But essentially, this is what filtering is. You are letting some components of the frequency domain pass through more than others. right? And um, so you might say, I want an H that looks like where the magnitude, and we'll worry about phase later. The phase does matter, but, but for these types of statements, it's magnitude that we're really talking about. And you say, I want um, a system that behaves more like this. Okay, very, you know, not all that silly ripple stuff. I want it to just kind of let low stuff pass and not high stuff. Okay. Now, can we, can we design such a system? Well, it's very straightforward. In fact, what if I go to the extreme here? I'm going to make this be a completely sharp ideal cutoff. This is known as the ideal low pass filter. Anything generally of this shape is called a low pass filter, but this is the ideal low pass filter. Okay, and so this is saying you have some cutoff. For now, I'll just make it a half so that we can stay simple. You cut off everything, every frequency above a half in absolute value. It will pass everything else. Okay, can we do such a thing? It is going to be a convolution because this is an LTI process. Okay, if we're multiplying in the frequency domain, we are doing convolution in the time domain. But what are we convolving with? Okay, I hear it. It's sync because if you have h of f equals rect of f, then h of t equals sync. We just took the uh, the opposite. We started with rect. Our first example was rect in the time domain because we were doing average over window. And we found out that sync in the frequency domain. And now we're doing the exact opposite. We're saying if we want an ideal rect in the frequency domain, then we have a sync in the time domain. So that means you're averaging. So you're 
Your averaging weight, weights are sinc t. So you're actually doing that type of a thing. You're, you're averaging like this, and we and this is at one and two, three. Height of one. Okay. There's sync in time. You're actually counting some parts negative and some parts positive. You're actually doing that as your weights of the averaging. What was the question? Absolutely. That's the next thing we'll do. Yep. The uh, because of duality. Right. Okay. So why w would this be better then? Should we average like this if we want to remove noise? Well, it's hard to say what's better and what's worse. I mean, we would, this would be the ideal low-pass filter. There are some things that you may not like about averaging with this. Notice how the effects of the averaging linger on forever. So in other words, if you have a sharp transition of your actual signal you care about, right, because of the low-pass filtering, what's going to happen is the effects of that transition in your signal, when you convolve with a sink, because the tails of the sink keep going, right? It's going to affect the output at times very far in the future and very far in the past to some small degree. Okay? You'll get sort of ringing. In fact, if you, um, if you look at uh, JPEGs that have been compressed um, and you look at like text that's been compressed, often you'll see little ripples around the edges of the text because texts are sharp transitions. And it's because of what, what happens during the compression process of JPEG, you essentially are doing somewhat of a low-pass filter. So you end up with maybe you wanted a sharp trend. Uh, transition. It was important to you, and, and it ends up with ripples, because when you convolve with the sink, you get these sort of ripples. Okay. So it's not clear that this is even what you want. People often do something in between. They say, well, I, they, they actually might design something in the frequency domain or the time domain to be a little less ideal. It falls off more gradually. Okay. And, they can, and then, you know, this is all part of digital signal processing, something we won't spend a lot of time in this class discussing techniques for designing the right filter. Um, but there's all sorts of study on that. You, know, you, can, you can go very far with that if you want. OK. Um, so then, yes, we have what we call the um, modulation property, which is, exactly, uh, which is exactly the dual to this property. That is that multiplication in time is convolution in frequency. So multiplication in time, people refer to as modulation. That's modulation. So specifically, this means that f of um, x of t times y of t equals x of f convolved with y of f. And this is because of duality. In fact, we could check using duality. Um, Okay, so um, because notice that if we swapped it around and we did something very strange with our x of f convolved with uh, y of f, if we replace the argument with t, because remember that the argument's just a dummy variable, I, I'm just going to replace it with t be, because that's more natural when we say take a Fourier transform. Could have left f if we wanted. Okay, take a Fourier transform of this. All right. Now we know by the convolution property that we're going to get the Fourier transform of capital X of t that, uh, times the Fourier transform of y of t. Okay, but we have a dual property that if you take the 
Of course, the inverse Fourier transform of x, of capital X, is little x, right? That's kind of how we defined capital X. But here we're taking a forward Fourier transform, and duality says that that's simply going to be um, little x of negative f. Okay, it's just going to flip it around that we did the, the forward Fourier transform rather than the reverse one. And then that's little y of negative f. And at this point, we just say, oh, okay, well, um, now I'm going to use duality on this entire statement and say that um, the, the, um, that the Fourier transform this way, x of minus t, y of minus t Fourier transform should be whatever this thing is, this convolution, then reversed in time. You see, here's where our um, imprecise convolution notation comes back to bite us, because I, I don't have a simple way of saying reverse this whole thing in time. If I use that other, if I use the notation like this, then I could say reverse in time by putting a negative there. But we're going with the usually easier notation. And then in this case, I'm just going to say reverse in time. Okay. And all you have to know is, okay, well, re both sides of these things, if you, we, we oh, a property that I'll, I'll state next. If you reverse both sides of a Fourier transform in time, if you reverse the input, the, a signal in time, it's the same as reversing the frequencies of the Fourier transform. So that, let me state that as a formal property. Time reversal property. It's actually just derived from the time scaling property. And that is that, F, that the Fourier transform of x of negative t, you just reverse that in time, and that's just going to equal capital X of negative f. You just reverse the frequency domain in uh, the frequencies, you just swap positive and negative frequencies. Okay, like I said, this is just a special case of scaling property, the time scaling property. Time scaling property with A equals negative 1. Okay, so with that in mind, we look back at this statement and this was by duality. Okay, and we get that, all right, so I can reverse both sides of this in time. I'll get back to my x of t, y of t over here. And we just have to trust that um, if you reverse both inputs, um, that reversing the result of a convolution in time is equivalent to reversing both signals that went into the convolution in time. Okay, fine. We didn't really need to prove that, but uh, um, it's interesting to see that duality will get us um, a lot of, I mean, basically any property you think of forward, just switch them around. You're pretty, it, it, you're, it's going to hold because of duality. It, it, there may be cases where you have to change the sign of something. In this case, you don't. So multiplication in time is convolution in the frequency domain, which is sort of a, a strange um, idea, but you're, you're going to be familiar with, it, with uh, this idea if you've ever thought about um, two uh, sounds that are very close in frequency. How many of you uh, play music? Got some musicians. All right. And uh, if you're out of tune, what, what happens? Yes, what happens? Yeah, you get some sort of vibration. You get these beat frequencies. If you've got two very pure tones and they're just slightly out of tune, you actually get these beat frequencies. And that's when you know you're close to being in tune. You've you got to tune it um, a little better. So you get this like wah, wah, wah. The, the pitch of the sound is vibrating very quickly. But you hear some much lower frequency uh, uh, amplitude change, okay? Because you've got two sounds that are very close in frequency. And if you just look at the mathematics of it, you'll see that um, the beat frequency is actually uh, related to the difference of the two frequencies, the frequency of the beat. Uh, this is what I mean by beat frequency. So if you add, um, let's say this is a uh, modulation example. Okay. 
fact, I should have done this in MATLAB so you can hear it. I could open up MATLAB and we could, we could hear the sum of two sinusoids. And, uh, maybe I'll do that. Let's try. Need sound. Let's see if I can get some sound here. Let's check that system. Okay. All right. Let's do something like this. All right. Equals. Should give us one second. All right, let's do um, this one equals sine of two pi times, let's say, 400 hertz um, for fs times t. All right, and then let's do x2, another sound that is. 400 and maybe 3. OK. So 440 is an A on the music scale. So we're a little below an A. I think 440 is A, right? I put it in one of your labs. All right. So um, now I don't want to have, OK, so let's try this. x1 plus, well, let's just do x1 first. Let's just let's make sure it worked. Oh, something's wrong. Oh. Oh, yes. Good point. Thank you. Don't need to put it here because I have T at actual valid points in time. OK. Oops. What am I doing? Four, three. OK. A little bit loud. Let's do that again. Okay, and x2. Sounds very similar. Uh -huh. You hear that coming in and out, right? Maybe I'll do a, another example with it separated slightly more in frequency. So we've got x2 will be 410. OK, they're out of tune with each other. If you were to estimate the frequency of those beats, it would be related to the difference, which is 10 hertz here. Right? OK, so let's look at this mathematically just to see what's happening. So if you take, let's say I have two, a cosine of um, 2 pi f1 t, where let's say f1 is large. Large meaning, maybe that's 400 hertz. Maybe that's our sound signal. Okay. Okay. And then you have, and then you modulate it with something what does it mean to multiply or modulate 2 pi f1 t times cosine of 2 pi f2 t? Yeah, we were, but we're, we're going to do this backwards. I'm going to multiply here, and we're going to see how it is this ends up being the sum. So we're going to kind of arrive at that backwards. All right. So um, 
where F2 is small, let's say something like example 10. Okay? Then what does this look like in time? Here's T. Well, you have some high frequency, so we've got two parts, right? We've got this part here, which is some, some high frequency. Uh, I'm not going to be able to draw this very well. It's actually, okay, and then you have some low frequency part here, which is like this. All right, and when you multiply these, you're going to get something like the following. The result is, so I'll test my handwriting, my drawing skills. Okay, I'm, I'm not doing it very accurately here. You, <laughs> you, get this, uh, you get this sort of packet, this sort of envelope that the wave follows, right? All right, and that envelope is the low frequency, and we would, we, usually what you would refer to is you'd say that low frequency signal is modulated by a high frequency. That's usually what happens in practice when you're modulating. You modulate by some high frequency signal. But anyway, we just multiplied, and we see what happened. If we were to do this multiplication, we would, we would get something like we heard here. We would get sound that gets louder and, and quieter because we multiplied, right? Okay, so this is maybe what you would expect. Uh, the, this is maybe how you would try to reproduce the sound we just made. You might say, well, I'm going to take the pitch and I'm going to multiply it by something that shapes it, makes it louder and quieter. But let's see that mathematically what this is equivalent to. It's going to be equivalent to the way we actually did it. Okay, it's gonna, let's say, okay, using the modulation property, we have... In, um, <laughs> oh, I've gone out of order because I want to take a Fourier transform of a cosine and yet haven't done that in the lecture yet. Um. <laughs> okay, we will have to come back to this and see why. <laughs> why? Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, we'll come back soon. Yeah, you could do it with a, okay. You could do this straight with trig identities and you could get that it's the sum of two, uh, two cosines that are near each other. We'll come back to it to show how the modulation property gets you there, okay? But it, it's equal, equal mathematically to adding two pitches that are close together, all right? Um, yes, we'll come back. Well, that'll be something to look forward to. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. All right. Um, okay, so this is important. Just a second. Okay. First of all, um, I want to point out something. Convolution commutes. Now, we said it commutes at the end of class last time. I said that you can swap the order of uh, the, the two signals in a convolution, right? Now, the, given the convolution property of the Fourier transform, this should now be completely obvious because, I mean, you could just inspect the convolution integral or sum directly to convince yourself that x convolved with y equals y convolved with x, okay? Or you could just say, huh, x, x of t convolved with y of t in the Fourier domain is just x of f um, times y of f, and we know that multiplication commutes. Right, so that equals y of f times x of f, and take the inverse Fourier transform of that, and that's just y of t convolved with x of t. So there's a, a very simple argument that the order of the convolution doesn't matter. All right, and remember what that implied. It implies that if you think of one of the signals as your impulse response and the other as the input signal, you could swap their uh, roles and you would get the same output. Okay, so now let's do all right something else I want to do. 
And this is delta functions. How do delta functions behave under the Fourier transform? Okay. So delta functions, we defined them last time, talked about their properties, and then we, um, we used them for one purpose to kind of show that you can derive convolution from LTI systems using the delta function. However, they're going to be very useful for many reasons, and I'm going to give you a few reasons now. And you should keep in mind that delta functions always let us cheat in some way or another. Okay? So first way it lets us cheat. All right? Let's look at the delta function. Uh, let's look at the Fourier transform of a delta function. Okay, so what is Fourier transform of? Let's even be more interesting. Let's do a shifted delta. Okay, delta of t minus some constant tau or cap t. I'll do. Okay. Well, we can do the integral. I'll actually, I'll let you do it. Uh, someone want to work that out? This should be a very quick integral to do. Yeah? E to the negative 2 pi i t. Perfect. Cap T. Oh, with an F. Yes, we, we got to leave the F there. So, oops. All right. And you just used the sifting property, and, which applied directly to the Fourier transform. So we could have plugged in the integral, and we'd, we'd get this out. Thank you. So um, that's interesting. I mean, already it's kind of cool. So if T was 0, we're just talking about the ordinary delta function at time 0, then what is this? This is just 1. The Fourier transform of a delta function uh, is so that means that delta of t goes to 1 after taking a Fourier transform. 1 for all frequencies. Okay? And it also means that if we shift the delta, of course, we get something. This has magnitude 1. And the phase is just. Um, 2 pi t f. So the phase is linear in frequency. So if we were to plot this, we would do like a, we would plot the magnitude. The magnitude plot is, is just going to be flat, right? It's just going to be 1. This is the magnitude. And the phase The phase is just going to, oh, whoops, there's a negative I left out, right? The phase is gonna, just going to be, have a slope of negative 2 pi t. Oh, boy. All right. If you look at that magnitude, you say, oh, okay, the delta function, if, if this was a system, if this was the impulse response of a system was a delta function, then it passes through all frequencies doesn't attenuate or amplify any of them. It just adds phase if it's delayed delta. Okay, so that's, that's kind of fun. Now, by duality, by duality, we would say that if you Fourier transform 1, or actually, let me keep it more general. If you Fourier transform, let's generalize this and keep it as e to the i 2 pi um, T. Actually, I'm going to do capital F is our constant now. Before we were using capital T as the constant, but just because it's nice here. Capital F, if you take a Fourier transform of this, then you just get delta of F minus capital F. You get a shifted delta function. Okay. Now, the bottom line is delta functions allow us very nicely to cheat here. Why do I say this is cheating? Hmm. 
Is there any reason why I should say this is cheating? So um, try plugging this into the Fourier transform integral. You're not going to get anything meaningful out of it. Fourier transform is supposed to work for finite energy signals, not periodic signals. This is periodic. This is a sinusoid, complex exponential, right? It's not, the Fourier transform is not meant to handle these things. It doesn't converge. Um, what do we do with periodic signals if we want to do some sort of Fourier analysis? What do we use? The series, yes. The, the, we would use the continuous time Fourier series here. And we would get a sequence of numbers that are coefficients. Okay? And it turns out, if you do if it's the Fourier series of this guy, it, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. But here we're doing the Fourier transform on something that it wasn't intended to handle. And the only reason we can do it is because we've defined these delta functions, these non-existent uh, functions that just make our life easy in cases like this, where we can now have periodic signals that we actually can handle with the Fourier transform. Okay? Um, because the, the way we handle them is we say, oh, these are delta functions in the frequency domain. Okay. So let's, let's do an example of where this would be useful. Up above here, we would say, What's the Fourier transform of this? Well, it's, this is 1 half e to the i 2 pi uh, f1 t plus e to the minus i 2 pi f1 t. Right? OK, so what's the Fourier transform? Well, it's very simple. The, if we do the Fourier transform here, we get 1 half delta of f minus f1 or, yeah, hold on, did I do that correctly here, yeah, plus delta of F plus F1, okay, similarly for this guy over here, so that means that in the frequency domain, In the frequency domain, our green one, the, uh, sorry, the blue one that we underlined is, here's f. The blue one is two delta functions separated at plus and minus f1. So here is frequency 0. And we have, um, we have a delta function here. Oh, sorry, f1 was, was large. F1 was large. It was about like 400, right? So 400, something like that, and minus. And these each have height 1 half. Okay, so that's our signal and frequency of the one cosine, the first cosine, right? And the second one has, is very similar, but it's down at lower frequency. Okay? And... The modulation property says that what these do to each other in frequency, when we multiply them in time, what they do in frequency is a convolution. So let's practice doing convolution with delta functions. You'll see how easy it is. Okay. So I'm going to make some room here. So now we've done Fourier transform of delta functions. Now let's do convolution with delta functions. So if you have a um, delta t minus cap t convolved with anything, what do you get? Have we done this? We might have done it. I don't know. So again, you can plug this into the convolution integral. And it will pop right out just as fast as the last one did. So I'll let you try it again. See if someone, anyone can beat our champion from previous try. Okay. And what's the answer then of convolving? Remember what this means here. This is a delta function that occurs at time cap t. And what did I hear? X of t minus cap t. So in other words, you had, you had something, some x that was like this. Here's time zero. You had um, 
you had a, a delta function that occurred at some time t. And the result is simply um, the same thing delayed by centered. You move the center of the old location over right, to the new location. So it just caused a delay. The delta function, the delayed delta function causes a delay after convolving. And so you get like this. Whoops, that's not accurate. OK, so this is the result. It's just delayed. Remember, the delta function is like the identity function for convolution. Anything convolved with a delta is just the same thing. And now we have a delayed delta. It caused it to delay. OK, so then we can. Um, now, what's often useful, if you have a sum of delta functions, if instead you had like you know, delta t minus uh, so if you have like a delta t minus t1 plus delta, let's say plus, just to be interesting, 3 delta t minus t2 convolved with something else, then of course you split it up. Use linearity of convolution. Say this should equal x of t minus t1 plus 3 x of t minus t2. Okay, so you can... This is one way to attack uh, a convolution if you've got delta functions in it. All right. In discrete time, anything can be written as convolutions. So sometimes the best, I mean, sorry, anything can be written as delta functions. Okay. So sometimes if you're actually trying to compute a discrete time uh, convolution, you, there are two methods. The one that you are taught and that you'll probably see most frequently if you looked up anything about convolution. The, the formula makes it look like you should flip one of the signals in time and do a shift the flip and shift technique, and multiply and, and sum. Okay, That's one mechanism for going through and doing it. But sometimes a discrete time signal, if it's short in duration, it's even faster just to say, well, this is a sum of some specific delta functions. Just like we wrote up this rect at the beginning as, you know, this rect here could be written. I could write it as unit step functions subtracted, but you could also write it as this explicit sum of delta functions. Okay? And then you could go through and do each, se each one separately. And sometimes that's faster. All right. um, OK. So then that means if, we're, if we go here, back to our example of the modulation, we have, we've multiplied a low frequency cosine with a high frequency carrier, let's say. Well, what's the convolution going to be then? Of what's the result of the convolution here between the green and the blue? I, does someone want to come draw it? Get to use my stylus? Okay, volunteer. I know someone knows what it looks like. So come up and in red, draw on uh, right over this graph what the result is of the convolution of the green and the blue. Yes, in the frequency graph. Yes. So this graph here, what's the result going to look like when you convolve these? Oh, I see hands moving. Come on, someone come, come on down. Draw. <laughs> OK, well, oh, we, have, we have someone back there. Yeah. Thank you. Two people volunteered. And, yes. All right, thank you. So here, you, don't, you do not have to push this button. In fact, try not to. Just draw on this. Yep. It's all right. You can put the number. We'll, we'll see you then. All right, excellent. Good job. OK. So that's the con what happened with the convolution. You you just pick one of them. I mean, I would pick the uh, I would pick the blue one. I would decompose the blue one into two separate delta functions, and I would say, hmm, the the if I took only this delta function of blue and convolved it with the green, I would shift the green centered around the blue. Okay, and so I get these two red. Of course, half times half makes a quarter, and then I have to take care of this one as well. So I use linearity. All right, so that's that's great. I'm assuming you did something like that. 
Yes, so last time I said we don't have a way of multiplying delta functions, right? But because delta functions allow all sorts of tricks, once we've observed that anything convolved with a delta function is just that same thing back, then we'll just use that. We won't explicitly throw del two delta functions into the convolution integral. We'll just use this knowledge here. Okay, so that's what happens when you use delta functions. There are pluses and minuses, mostly pluses, but the minuses are that sometimes when you try to brute force something, like for example, if you try to brute force find this relationship by looking at the integral, the Fourier transform integral, it's not going to work. Okay, so it works re in reverse. Use the inverse Fourier transform with the delta function. That'll work fine. But then you just have to say, okay, I can verify it one way. I know, you know, and then know, use what you know about forward and backwards Fourier transforms. Use what you know about convolution to do cases like this. Okay, so you see that we, we didn't have to know any trigonometry and we could have figured out that the product of two cosines is actually, can be written as a sum. Because now we have, what we know is we have this red signal here. And if we want, we can loop, we can um, group these. The two inner ones are one cosine and the two outer ones are another cosine. And in fact, we know now that the frequency is gonna be 410 and, f and 390 of those two exponentials, right? And this will be minus 390 and minus, uh, minus 410. And so the, you'll get one cosine at frequency 390 and one at frequency um, 410 added together. So we see that modulating was the same as adding two things that were close in frequency, right? Okay. In fact, you did a homework. Sometimes it's best to, um, this, this kind of encourages you sometimes to look for multiple ways of, of like calculating a Fourier transform. Because you see, like I already mentioned, if you, were, if you needed to know what's the Fourier transform of this, if you're a mathematician, you'd say, well, it doesn't exist. And if you're, and if you're in this class, you'll say, oh, it's a delta function. And um, so, uh, but, you're not, but you have to know this pair so you know the reverse relationship. In other words, you, now we know complex exponentials are going to be delta functions. So sometimes when you see something like a sinusoid or a complex exponential in time and you need to calculate Fourier coefficients, it's better done by inspection uh, than by actually trying to just brute force through the integral. Okay. Um, an example of that was in your problem set. Uh, in the very first problem set, we gave you a signal that we wrote explicitly as a sum of complex exponentials, and we said, what are the Fourier series coefficients? And most people, most students, because you're just, you know, just learning this material, you're going to plug it into the integral for the Fourier series, and you'll calculate the, the correct coefficients. But in fact, it's just as good and, and much faster to say, oh, I already know what a Fourier series is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to split my signal into complex exponentials. If I already see that it's written as a sum of complex exponentials, then by inspection, in other words, not by using the analysis equations, but by using the synthesis equations, I can just sort it out and say, here are the coefficients. The coefficients are whatever is multiplied by the ex exponentials. Okay, they both get you the same answer, but one way is a lot faster. Okay. Um, Okay, some other things about the, uh... okay. All right, so this is gonna be kind of fun. I think these properties are kind of, kind of cool. If you have, so any signal can be split into, so we can split a signal into four parts uniquely. And that is, um, let's say you have a real 
um, even part, a real odd part. I don't need capital R. Imaginary, even, and imaginary, um, odd. Okay, remember we, we already, in the very first lecture or second one, we gave formulas for breaking up a, a number into a, a real and imaginary part. We also looked at how you can decompose any signal into an even and odd part. And if you do both of these, you end up with now four parts. Okay, so if you, you decompose it into its even part and then decompose it into its real part and its imaginary part, then you get four separate components of your signal and it's unique doing this sort of decomposition. Okay. But the cool thing is that we can show that there, that any, so, so by linearity, you suppose we want to look at the Fourier transform here. So this is time. And, and then we want to say, let's look at the um, frequency domain. In other words, the, that same signal after taking a Fourier transform. Now by linearity, each one of these, I could just divide it up into the sum of these things and I could take the Fourier transform of each of them, okay? And I'm going to get something interesting. Any signal that's both real and even is always going to be, the frequency domain is also going to be real and even, okay? Anything that is um, imaginary and even, of course, this one's pretty obvious, is going to go to imaginary and even. So these stay in their same category. I'm not saying it's going to, th that the, actual function is going to be the same. I'm just going to say, I'm just saying if it was imaginary and even to begin with, and you take a Fourier transform, it's going to be imaginary and even. Okay. Um, of course, once you know this one, then you know this one because all you t can do is take a real part and multiply by i and you have an imaginary part. And by linearity, you, you should just multiply this by i. Okay. But these ones swap over. Okay, I should have written them next to each other. This graph is a little bit confusing. So we, all right, so, um, what, so what I mean is this. If you have an, an odd part of a signal, then it swaps from being real to imaginary or from being imaginary to real. Okay, so, um, and these happen in reverse too. So if you took the inverse Fourier tra transform, of course, it's all, this is just a symmetric diagram here. So odd parts of, the, odd signals will end up being switching from real to imaginary or vice versa when you take a Fourier transform or inverse Fourier transform. Okay, we could verify this. There's not much time, so um, I'll just verify one of them. No, I'm not, I'm not going to verify it. Um, you guys can do it. Just go try to show that, you know, extra, extra um, exercise for those who want to. You can verify that this is actually true. But what this means is several things. We are often concerned with real signals, right? Every sound signal you've dealt with is real. It doesn't have an imaginary part. So in time, it's real. In frequency, it might, you know, it's complex. So let me say here, suppose that x of t is real. Well, that means it has a real even part and a real odd part, perhaps. Okay. What does that mean about its Fourier transform? Its Fourier transform will have a real even part and an imaginary odd part. So any real signal, the Fourier transform has only these parts to them. Right? A real even part and an imaginary odd part. If you were to plot it as a real and imaginary, you would see it very clearly. Even, you have an even in the real part and imaginary in the odd part. However, it's more important to us to look, I mean, like I said, we usually like to do magnitude and phase, right? When we, when we display the frequency domain, not real and imaginary. So what does this imply about, um, about magnitude and phase. Well, I will get there by first taking one intermediate and saying there's a, there's a name for this. 
Signals that are just composed of these two things are what we call conjugate symmetric. Okay, if they have just these two parts. Because what this name implies, conjugate symmetric means this. X of F equals X conjugate of negative F. Okay, so um, like I said, any signal that's only real will have only these two parts in time, which means it has only these two components in frequency. And that is conjugate symmetric. Now, conjugate symmetric I wrote in something that doesn't, in a way that doesn't look like that, but you can verify. Um, if, if, if it only has these two components, then it is conjugate symmetric because when you reverse the, um, when you reverse x in frequency, okay, the even part doesn't matter, doesn't change, but the odd part becomes negative, right? When you reverse an odd part horizontally, it becomes negative of what it started as. So reversing in frequency is equivalent to just making the imaginary part negative, and that's what a conjugate is. Okay. So we've just verified that if, if it has only these two parts, then it would be conjugate symmetric. And the opposite is true, too. If it's conjugate symmetric, it only has these two parts. Okay, so the conclusion, a real signal in time is conjugate symmetric in frequency. Now, to finish off that thought, we should understand what does that mean in terms of magnitude and phase. Um, and, well, the magnitude of, uh, of a signal is not affected by whether you take a conjugate, right? So if we took the conjugate of both sides of this equation, sorry, if we took the absolute value, the magnitude of both sides of this equation, of course the conjugate would go away, right? And it would say that the magnitude is symmetric. So magnitude, oops, magnitude is symmetric about zero. It's always symmetric if your signal is real. All right, and the phase, and what do we say about the phase? Can anyone guess how the phase is going to look for conjugate symmetric? Well, it's actually going to be odd because, yeah, it's going to be odd. And you could, again, verify it from this formula. So the phase, whatever it looks like, will be, all right, will be odd. All right. So not only is the real part even and the imaginary part odd, but the magnitude is even and the phase is odd for any real signal. Now, you probably encountered this in your labs because every time we take Fourier transforms of signals, you get the same thing in the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies when you look at the magnitudes. Maybe you haven't looked at the phases very carefully, but you would see that they're odd. So in reality, it's perfectly good if you know your signal is real, it's perfectly good to just you know, get rid of all of the... All of, get rid of that half that's just redundant, right? And only display the positive frequencies. And that would be more natural. That's, you know, th that's what you see when you see like a spectrum analyzer for music or whatever. You, you don't see positive and negative frequencies because it's really redundant. It's redundant, and you can imagine, you can see why it's, where the redundancy comes from because the Fourier transform is built to handle complex signals in both time and frequency. Complex, if you're only looking at real signals in time, you're only using one of the two dimensions. So something should be redundant in the Fourier transform, right? And that's where the redundancy shows up in the Fourier transform. You don't need the plus and minus if you knew it was real, all right? If you look at a Fourier transform and it doesn't have this symmetry, then what do you know? What? It's a complex signal. Yes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>